as bright Flowing an endless stream Bits of information Logic, black and white Bits and bites of information Welcome to Bits and Bytes. In this episode, we're going to see how computer simulations and computer games can be used in education. We'll analyze what the elements of a good game are and see how these are really the same elements that go to make a good lesson. We'll also explore the meanings of the word analog and digital and what that mysterious phrase, booting DOS, means. We'll start by looking at some simulations. Well, I know what a game is, but what's simulation? The most familiar example is a flight simulator, a mock-up of a real airplane that trainee pilots practice on before they're let loose on the real thing. It's a model of a real-life situation. Well, can you put a simulation like that on a microcomputer? No, but you can get a very simplified simulation of landing a 747, for example. There's one for the Atari on the table. Oh, yes, here we are. 747 landing simulator. That looks interesting. Or would you rather fly a helicopter? Ah, now you're talking. Well, then check the disc on the apple. Okay. Ah, here we are. Top lifter. You'll need game paddles for this program. Paddles? That sounds a little primitive. Using paddles to fly a helicopter? They're not really paddles. They're more like dials. And why do they call them paddles? Well, do you remember those electronic ping pong games that were so popular a few years ago? Mm -hmm. They were the first video games, and they used dials to control the ping-pong bats. So these dials came to be called paddles, and the name just stuck. Okay, well, where do I plug it in? On most computers, there's a socket on the outside for game paddles. But with the Apple, you plug the paddles right into its circuit board. Make sure the computer is turned off. Okay. Now remove its lid. Got a little stubborn there. I suppose if I hadn't turned it off, there was a good chance I'd get a shock, right? That's right, and you might damage the computer as well. Oh. Oh, I'm really into the nuts and bolts of this thing. Each of those little black boxes is called an IC, an integrated circuit. And the working part of the IC is that little slice of silicon known as a chip. But you can't actually see the chips, can you? No, they're usually hidden. But if you'd like to see one, look in that envelope beside you. Oh. Oh, my goodness. They really are small, aren't they? What does this one do? That one's a central processing unit, a CPU. Hmm. Oops. I just dropped my CPU. Oh, here we are. There. I better put that in the envelope so that we don't lose that. Very good. Okay. Oh, what are these? Well, they're extra circuit boards that have been added to the Apple. The one on the right runs the disk drives. Do you see the ribbons connecting it to the drives? Yes, I do. And the one on the left contains extra RAM memory. Okay, and is this the socket where I plug the paddles in? That's it. Okay, let's try that. You know, this makes me feel like a real computer expert. Okay, now put the lid back. There we are. Turn them on. Ah, here we go. My first sorte. One of those paddles makes the helicopter go up and down. And the button on the side turns it around. And the other paddle makes it fly forward and backward. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, turn it around a little bit. There we go. Whoa. Oh, this is tricky, isn't it? Uh-oh. Crash. Not so good. I'm glad nobody was aboard. Oh, here we go. Second sorte. I get another try. You know, being a pilot is not easy. But what I do find is that by using the paddles, it's a much more natural way of communicating with a computer than a keyboard. Yes, the movement of your hand is more directly related to what's happening on the screen. So instead of typing right 30, 
I just turn the dial and the helicopter goes right. A lot of games and simulations involve paddles and similar input devices to give you this directness of control. Actually, it's fundamentally different from communicating via the keyboard because the keyboard, like the computer itself, is digital, whereas the paddle is an analog device. Analog and digital are two different ways of describing quantity. If you ask a fisherman how many fish he has caught, and he holds up eight digits like this, he is describing the quantity of fish in a digital way. He's using separate individual digits to describe separate individual objects, which is fine because this is a very clear-cut situation. You either catch eight fish or you don't. You can't catch a little less or a little more than eight fish. But if you ask the fisherman how big the fish was that got away, and he holds his hands up like this, he is describing the quantity of missing fish in an analog way. The distance between his hands is an analogy for the length of the fish. And this analog way of describing quantity is much more convenient than the digital way when you have to describe something that can vary continuously given the elastic nature of the average fisherman's memory. In the world of machines, one of the commonest analog devices is a dimmer. The turning of the knob corresponds to the fading up or down of the light. It is a continuously variable device. The light can be more or less on. Contrast this with a light switch which is the simplest digital device of all. The light is either on or off. Which brings us to that collection of on-off switches which is called a computer. Obviously itself a digital device, since it has to deal with everything in terms of binary digits. The computer's keyboard is also digital. There are lots of separate individual keys, and you either press one or you don't. But this can be awkward when you have to describe something which varies continuously, such as the movement of a little rocket ship on the screen, because you have to fragment this movement into separate units, forward 30, right 90, forward 30, and so on. So here is where it's much better to use the analog way of representing continuous movement by means of game paddles, which relate directly to what is happening on the screen. The more you turn the paddle, the more the rocket ship turns. But there's room for both ways, of course, both analog and digital. If you want to represent reality in a smooth, continuous fashion, go analog. If you want to represent reality one little piece at a time, go digital. But how does this analog information get turned into digital information for the computer? By means of an analog digital converter. There's one already built into the Apple. Ah, I see. Well, the choplifter program is fun, but do you have any really educational simulations? Simulations are perhaps the most educational use that you can make of computers because they all involve problem solving. You can divide simulations into three main types. Using machines, making decisions, or working through a process. So the choplifter program falls into the first type, using a machine. Are there any other examples of this type of simulation? Yes, there's a program that simulates an automatic banking machine on the pet computer. Oh, this is exactly like the machine at my bank. Yes, this simulation is much more realistic than the choplifter one. Choose what you want to do. Well, let's see now. I think I'll deposit some money. Enter the amount in dollars and cents, so... Well, let's say $1,000. To which account? I think we'll put it in the checking account. Please put the envelope in deposit opening. Okay. Envelope accepted. Thank you. Please wait. Okie dokie. Space bar. This program was designed especially for children in grades four and five, because when they grow up, they may be doing a lot of their banking by machine. Well, I better quit while I'm ahead. Ah, isn't that nice? I got congratulations. Now that you know how to fly a helicopter and use an automatic banking machine, it's time for you to learn how to run a lemonade stand. <laughs> it's on the Atari. We're going up all the time. Okay, how many lemonade stands are there? One lemonade stand. 
I'm sure the prices have gone up a lot since I had a lemonade stand. Okay, here we go. Now, how many glasses? Well, we'll start conservatively with ten glasses. How many signs? I think three. We should let folks know we're in business. What price would you like to charge? I think ten cents is reasonable. Uh, do you want to change anything? No, I don't believe so. So, I made ten glasses. I sold ten glasses. Terrific. I made a profit of 35 cents. My assets are $2.35. So, actually, this teaches children how to run a business, how to make business decisions. Yes, it shows them patterns and relationships between various factors. Selling price, advertising costs, the price of sugar, and so on. And, of course, it also gets them to practice their math in a meaningful way. So you could actually run several of these lemonade stands simultaneously? Well, that's another advantage of many simulations. They're very good for working with a group. A number of children in the class can use the program at the same time, each child looking after a different lemonade stand. Okay, and what was the third type of simulation? These, uh, working through a process? Right. Now you're going to work through a potentially dangerous process, hmm. controlling the operation of a nuclear power plant. Is this it? Nice. Scram. A nuclear power plant simulation. Okay. Oh, this ought to be interesting. Okay. Now. For this simulation, you're going to need a joystick. Oh. Oh, this is it here. Where do I plug it in? Into the front of the Atari. The socket on the left. Oh, yes. Here we are. The joystick moves the cursor to various valves and pumps. Huh. By holding the orange button down and moving the joystick up or down, you can open or close the valves and pumps. This is a very good simulation, but it's also very complicated. Man, we have trouble already. Okay. Oh, no! I goofed. Meltdown. Wow. Well, I can see it's safer to practice on a simulation than the real thing. <laughs> That's one of the main reasons for using simulations, to experience things that are very difficult to experience in reality, either because they could be too dangerous, too expensive, too small, too big, too fast, or too slow. And all of these have, in fact, been simulated on the computer. But now let's go to an actual classroom to see how simulations can fit into a geography lesson. There are two types of computer programs which I'm presently making use of. One deals with computer simulation, and the other one with uh, quantitative or statistical analysis. The first, the computer simulations, is an attempt, as it applies to geography, to duplicate some of the variables that take place in the real world. The program we're doing right now is a simulation game in which uh, we're cattlemen in Africa, in Ghana, and we're trying to uh, sell 10 cattle between five towns to make a profit to keep our family alive for a year. You have to decide where to sell your 10 cattle and you have to make $100 a year and it gives you a list of the prices according to the precipitation. So you've got to predict whether to sell them in a dry area or a wet area. And the computer tells you how you've done afterwards. And most of the time you don't make it. You don't, you starve. <laughs> your cattle die of disease or you starve, which isn't good. <laughs> So here we have a situation which is as close to real life as possible using some selected variables and trying to duplicate and show the problems experienced by cattle ranchers as they herd their cattle to market. It's an ideal tool in terms of letting the students have this additional experience regardless of the textbook. Here's some facts. What do they mean? Change the variables around. What do they tell you? Now it poses all kinds of questions for them and gives them answers that are unexpected. But that's part of the game. That's part of the experience of the computer.
It's exciting for the students and me. $25. We couldn't do this out of a textbook because um, the computer changes things every year. It seems more like you're there because everything happens so quickly that you don't have to worry about reading and just easier access to the information. Reading about the problems is simply reading. Understanding the relationships between the problems that the farmer faces, the risks that he takes, can be presented by the computer and the students can actually work with it. Without the computer, I could not give the students the opportunity to do this, to find out for themselves. They would simply have to read some secondhand account and it has, for that reason, less impact. How many groups made money? <laughs> it's a risky business. What was the problem in your group? When you made predictions based on rainfall, it changed. The rainfall wasn't predictable. Was that it? Yeah. Any other simulations give the student a chance to work with the processes, the parameters they can identify. In many instances, it's a field trip. It's getting them out of the classroom. They're in the classroom, they're stuck by a box, but they're doing something that they could not do in the classroom without the computer. Hmm. Well, I can certainly see there's a place in education for simulations, but games... I'm not so sure. Can you show me some examples of educational games? We'll be going to that in a moment, but let's go first to the home of computer games, the Atari company itself in California, and one of their leading game designers, Chris Crawford. Eastern Front is a war game, and with any game, really, it's very hard to separate the educational from the recreational. And indeed, Eastern Front makes some very important points about the nature of war that have a great deal of educational significance to just about anybody involved in the body politic. As a war game, you are the German invading Russia. And you'll find the temptation in this war game is to frontally attack the Russians, to bash them with your big powerful tank units. And so you charge and blow up those Russians and so forth. And if you do that, you will fail for sure. The way you win in Eastern Front is that you don't use superior firepower. You don't use numbers. You use mobility, maneuverability, and above all, you attempt to break the army's will rather than kill the soldiers. And you learn that lesson in this game. You learn that having more tanks or better tanks or bigger guns really doesn't make much difference. And I hope people who play the game and try hard to win will learn that lesson and I think it'll make them better citizens. A game represents reality. But it represents reality in a very different way than most people think. We have games and we have simulations. Now, the difference between the two is that a simulation emphasizes the detail of the real world and a game deliberately suppresses detail in order to accentuate some broader issue. It's rather like the difference between a blueprint and a painting. So a game is really a way of teaching people about the real world. It is also fun because we enjoy learning. Learning is intrinsically a lot of fun. If an educational process is not fun, then that's probably because the educational process has missed something somewhere. The nice thing about the computer is you can experiment, you can make mistakes, and you can say, oh, rats, oh, well, and press the start button, and you start all over, no harm done. If you want to, you can do this all alone so nobody will know how stupid you are. And you can experiment and learn a lot more freely. That's one of the real advantages of this technology for educational purposes. It reacts to people. A book lays there like a dead fish. The nice thing about the computer is the student can say, what if I do this? And the computer immediately responds. And so the student is encouraged to, to participate, to be mentally and intellectually involved in what's going on here. Yes, these are games, but they are certainly educational. But you know, he didn't talk about Space Invaders or Pac-Man or Donkey Kong. What did they teach you? Hand-eye coordination plus some strategy development. That's about it. But even a shoot-em-up game has elements that can be put to educational use. Look at Spotlight on the Apple. It was produced by the Sesame Street organization. Here you must hit the little man with a beam of light. 
You use the paddle to tilt the mirror and the button to turn the spotlight on. Ah, missed him. If you succeed, you get a little reward. Oh. <laughs> He's elusive. But I got him. Isn't he terrific? Okay, now we'll try and get him again. We got him. So instead of firing missiles, I'm firing light and learning the angles at which light is reflected. That's it. And a teacher could build a simple lesson about the behavior of light using this game as a starting point. And that's just one example of an arcade game technique being used educationally. Well, so much for the physical games. Now can you show me a mental computer game that teaches you something? Well, one of the most popular mental games for the computer is the maze or labyrinth game. There's an example in the disc in the pet. It's called Labyrinth. Okay. You can give the following instructions. F, move forwards one block. L, turn left 90 degrees. R, turn right 90 degrees. H, for help. I'll probably need that one. You can have a labyrinth with a maximum size of 19 blocks horizontally and 11 blocks vertically. How wide do you want it? Okay, well, let's say six. How deep? We'll try six again. You've got 12 seconds to look at it. Oh, oh. Okay, now we have to enter there, and I turn right, straight up. Oh, that's going to be a tough one. Okay, right. All right, so first we have to enter in there, and then it's a right turn. And forward. And forward. Now I'll try another right turn. And forward, and right again, and forward, and, you know, I really think, I think I'm lost. What should I do now? Type H for help. Okay, I figured I'd need that. Oh, I see. It takes you from a worm's eye view to a bird's eye view. Teachers find these maze games very useful for developing a child's spatial awareness. You can switch from seeing the maze horizontally to seeing it vertically. Two different sorts of spatial perception. Well, I must say, computer games are fascinating. And you know, they're really fun. Yes, and a lot of educational research has been done recently into the magic ingredients that make computer games such fun to play. And of course, they're the same ingredients that make things fun to learn. Challenge continually adjusting the level of difficulty to keep up your interest. Fantasy, the creation of special micro-worlds in which you can play an imaginary role, and curiosity, the element of surprise and novelty, so that you're never quite sure what you're going to discover next. Challenge, fantasy, curiosity, and those are the exact areas where the computer is so strong. You know, I can see where there's a lot of potential for computer games and simulation, but tell me, are there any guidelines for teachers and parents in order for them to sort out the games that actually teach you something from games that, well, are just games? Well, most school boards now put out a list of recommended educational software. And then, of course, there are a number of magazines that specialize in computers and education. And most of them have regular reviews of learning programs for the computer, including games and simulations. Here's a review of an educational game. Dueling Digits. Educational value five on a scale of one to five. DOS required. Now, what is that DOS? I keep hearing people talking about booting DOS. What does that really mean? DOS is something we haven't dealt with yet, but it's about time we did. When you put a disk into a disk drive, you're taking a lot of things for granted. You're assuming that the computer will tell the disk drive to load the catalog of programs on that disk into the computer's random access memory. And that when you type load program X, the computer will tell the disk drive to search through the sectors of the disk until it finds that particular program and then load it. You're also assuming that the computer will know where on the disk to save programs. 
or store data, and so on and so forth. But how does the computer know all this? The answer is, it doesn't. The average small computer hasn't the faintest idea how to operate a disk. What it needs is a disk operating system, commonly known as DOS. Now DOS could be built into the ROM memory of the computer, but to save memory space, it isn't. It usually comes on the disk itself. But how does the computer know how to load the DOS from the disk into its RAM memory? Again, it doesn't. Because the program to do this is also on the disk itself. So how does the poor old computer ever get off the ground in this business of disk operating? Well, luckily, there is one tiny little startup program in the computer's ROM memory, which contains just enough instructions to load the program on the disk that can load the DOS on the disk that can tell the computer how to operate the disk. Because this little startup program enables the computer to get off the ground, to lift itself up by its own bootstraps in a sense, it is called a bootstrap program. That is why when a computer loads DOS into its RAM memory, we say that it is bootstrapping DOS, or simply booting DOS. I see, so when I boot DOS, I'm getting the computer to load DOS into itself so that DOS can start loading from the disk. That's it exactly. Okay, well, do all the disks I've been using have DOS on them? Yes, most of them do. But sometimes DOS comes all on its own on a separate systems disk. So no microcomputers have DOS built in? Most of them don't, but there are some exceptions. The Commodore line of computers, the PET, the VIC, and the 64, have DOS built into their disk drives so that disks for the Commodore machines don't need to have DOS on them. All right, so that's the booting DOS mystery cleared up. Now I know what analog and digital mean, and you've convinced me as to the value of educational games and simulations, and now I know where to go to get some help if I'm shopping for educational software. Oh, this looks interesting. While Billy's catching up on his reading, let me tell you about the subject of our next episode, which is computer graphics we're going to find out how the computer actually creates pictures on the screen. And this is only one pixel thick. And how you can use the computer as a sort of doodling pad. And we'll see how students are using the computer at the Ontario College of Art. Until then, I'm Lou Bagoy for Bits and Bytes. Oh. And I'm Billy Van. See you soon. I didn't know any of this. <laughs>